The Psalms are prayers and hymns of the Bible par excellence. Uttered in praise, joy, sorrow, and despair, spoken or sung in private and in public. By lay people, kings, poets, and priests, coming from both the righteous and repentant sinners, the Psalms have served as the prayer book and the hymn book. To generations of believers, for every man on every occasion can find in its Psalms. Well, it's a fabulous Friday morning here on With Win Hope. And we're so happy to have you joining us as we look at your mercies reaches onto the heavens. This morning, we only have one doctor in the house, Dr. K. White. And so we just want to wish everyone who's studying with us this morning a pleasant morning. And as we get ready and as we anticipate the Sabbath, we ask that God's blessings will flow. So at this time, we're going to invite Dr. White to greet us. Then she's going to pray for us. And then we're going to jump into our wonderful discussion for this morning. Hi, good morning to everyone. It's always a pleasure to be here on, on Whispering Hope on this beautiful Friday Friday morning. As, uh, as Chan just said, Dr. Wayno is not with us this morning. He is conducting a revival at this time. So even as I pray, we'll be praying for him and that God will use him mightily and that individuals will surrender to Christ even in that revival. It's a joy to be here and we'll have a wonderful lesson as far as as we pray. Father, today, thank you for this beautiful day. And the Bible reminds us that your mercies are new every morning. And this morning we can say our God is still a merciful God. We thank you for the ministry of Dr. Knowles and even as he continues to preach, we pray that you'd use him for your glory. Bless us as we go into our discussion. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Dr. White is just two of us this morning. I know we're going to have a wonderful time. You know, we do miss Dr. Knowles, you know, input. They're normally yeah. pretty deep, but I know we're going to do our best without him this morning. And we do wish him all the best in his revival. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to move upon him. And so your favorite psalm, I know you have given me quite a few, but I know we can never exhaust the book of Psalms. So talk to us this morning. All right. Uh, interestingly, from... Uh, February 1, I, I made a decision to start reading the Psalms from Psalm 1. So interestingly, I tried to read one chapter daily. I'm falling in love with the Psalm. And uh, yesterday, I read Psalm 13. And as I was going to the Sabbath school lesson this week, uh, a verse in Psalm 13 stood out in my mind that I don't think I had seen in this light since the discussion on the mercy. I'm going to Psalm 13, 5 says, but I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in this salvation. I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in this salvation. And as I, you know, I read this, I said, wow, this is amazing. Uh, there seems to be a link between mercy and salvation. And that's clearly uh, shared this week in the Sabbath school lesson. And that's because of God's mercy. We even have an opportunity to receive this salvation and so david is saying in this passage that he's trusting in god's mercy that god's mercy is reliable that he can trust it to the extent now he can rejoice in salvation because he has an understanding of the mercy of god when i read this and this stood in my mind i say wow this this is such an amazing verse, and it links so beautifully with the Sabbath school lesson. So I'm happy for the opportunity to share it as my favorite psalm. Just for this week, the favorite psalm will change by, by next week. Praise God. Psalm 13. We appreciate your, your love for the psalms, and as you start your, your journey again, we ask that not only will the lesson empower you, but your daily readings as well. And so we jump to our memory text for today. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations. For your mercies reaches unto the heavens, and your truth unto the clouds. Psalms 57, 9 and 10. Do you care to share with us what is your understanding of this particular text? Uh, this uh, memory verse this week is really a powerful memory verse, and it links with the topic, uh, your mercy, which is unto the heaven. And we consider this quarter, you know, the book of Psalms, you cannot run from 
the word mercy. Uh, in the book of Psalms, in one chapter this week alone, for his mercy endures forever. I remember those days when you read into the Psalms and you have to say, for his mercy endures forever, for his mercy endures forever. And when we consider, first of all, the, the mercy of God, we're speaking about the fact he's a compassionate God. We're speaking about the fact he's a loving God. We're speaking about his faithfulness to us. We're also thinking about the grace of God. And what is so beautiful about the memory verse uh, this week, the writer, first of all, recognizes that the mercy of God is beyond our comprehension. It is beyond our comprehension. Because then after the question, with the challenger, how high you know, is the heavens? I don't know. How wide is the heavens? I really can't answer that either. And the question, another question is, can I reach up to the heavens? No. Can you reach up to the heavens? No, we don't even know how far it is, you know. And, and when we consider the link between the mercies and the heavens, I think this is just a beautiful illustration that the writer is using here because the writer is saying there's really no limit to God's mercy because we cannot understand the height of the heavens. We cannot calculate it. We cannot reach it either. It's beyond us because we are, we are finite and we are limited to earth. And God is saying... And the psalmist is we are going to point that God's mercy is so beautiful and God's mercy is beyond our comprehension that we can do nothing else but praise him. We can do nothing else but respond to that mercy because it's just it's beyond what we can think about. And that's why I believe that the Bible writer says your thoughts are higher than our thoughts, your ways are higher than our ways. Because we just cannot understand this kind of mercy. And it goes back to the word love. We cannot understand his love and we cannot understand his mercy. Greater love has no man than this. Than a man who would lay down his life for his friends. And this is not any man. This is an innocent man. This is the, the God of the universe who laid down his life for us. So this mercy and this love, we cannot understand it. So what? how do we respond to it? We can do nothing else but to embrace it, to celebrate it, and to be excited about this love, which we just cannot understand. So the writer says two things here. He is singing about it. Amen. Some of us can't sing. You know, that's gifted in singing. But he says, I'm singing about it. He's overwhelmed by it. But he's also praising God for this mercy. And today, when I look at my life, we consider our lives as the challenger. What can we do but to embrace this mercy and just celebrate praise god you know i was about to ask you about the topic for the week but you have so nicely touched it in looking at our memory text so i'm not going to ask it again but god's mercy that endures forever is something that we can never ever fully comprehend you know because god's ways as you've said they're past finding out you know who can really fully grasp it and so our first question what are the practical implications of the fact that God's mercy is everlasting for the people's salvation. Wow, this is such a loaded question. Because first of all, as we consider God's mercy, we also have to consider our, our sinful nature. I mean, being very practical today. Um, we all have inherited a very a sinful nature. And because of this, we wrestle with sin every single day, as holy and righteous as we may be, as good Seventh-day Adventists and everyone else, who's listening to us this morning, we struggle with sin. Somebody says the, the struggle is real, the struggle is real, but the mercy of God brings hope to us. The mercy of God brings hope to us. So when we consider our salvation, you know, we recognize we are sinful, but there is mercy. And so there's hope as we consider salvation. I want to read Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3. The Bible says here, Psalm 14, 2 and 3, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. And verse 3 says, they all gone aside. They all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Have mercy. So as we consider uh, today the, how practical this mercy is, we see it all around us. Every single day, we are struggling with sin. But because of God's mercy, we recognize our sinful state, but we also recognize the salvation that is available. And Isaiah says, drink from the well of salvation. The psalmist says, drink from the cup of salvation. 
So salvation is available to everyone because the mercy of God, and it goes back to the very memory verse, because the mercy of God is limitless in spite of our sinful state. We are covered, as the songwriter says, covered with his life, whiter than snow, fullness of his life, then shall I know. So if there is enough mercy to help us in our sinful state. So we can rejoice in salvation because of God today. Amen. 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 And this follow-up question is, I think it needs answering. Why does this not mean that one can continue sinning because God's mercy is forever? And you know, there's some people who think that way. Well, talk to us, Dr. One. Yeah, this is so serious because, you know, God is ready to forgive, definitely. And we're speaking about his mercy. Because of his mercy, he's ready to heal us. Because of his mercy, he's ready to give us power to overcome sin. Now, if we take it for granted that God is going to heal us every time we sin, help, help us Holy Spirit today, God is going to cleanse us every time we sin, God is going to transform us every time we sin, that we can continue in sin. You know, the Apostle Paul says, shall you continue in sin because the grace is available? No, certainly not, because sin is dangerous. First of all, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, the sin separates us. Remember initially, because of sin in the Garden of Eden and because of the sinful nature we've inherited, God's plan is to reconcile us back to him. Every time we sin, we're creating, we're widening the gap we can see. So there is a separation that comes. So hence Isaiah says, it is not that God cannot hear. It's not that God does not have the intention to respond, but your sins have created a separation. So sin is dangerous because it separates. But sin is also like a disease. I like the way the writer was able to speak about this in David's cry this week when David said, my, my bones feel like they're broken. When David said, purge me with hyssop. And, and the author of the lesson indicating that in those days, those with the leprosy, they, the hyssop was placed upon them to declare that they are going to receive the healing. And David now sees his sin like it's a physical ailment. And, and it's like a disease that's eating out his flesh. So, so sin will eat out our flesh the same way cancer will, will dry every single <laughs> bone in your body and kill you. That is what sin will do. And there's some persons who say, well, I can sin and then I will ask for forgiveness. But you know what happens is the challenge is some people will never get an opportunity to ask for forgiveness because sometimes in that sinful moment, the enemy cuts you off from the planet. And so you die in your sin. And so the consequences and implications of sinful behavior, it is great. And it is something that we cannot risk our salvation over. The kingdom of God is available to us. The mercy of God is beyond our comprehension. So God is saying, be careful that you're taking my mercy for granted because sin is going to destroy us. And so we may even want to embrace him once again, but because of the fact we may have even committed the unpardonable sin because the sin has infected our body so much that the spirit can't even do a work for us. So we don't take those kind of chances with our salvation. Like David, every day we say, create in us a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within. A right, profound statement, Dr. White. You know, God's mercy, you know, some people take it for granted that it is something that is offered to us. And so there are people around us who don't recognize who God is. But because of his love, mercy is still trying to get their attention, but it will not last forever. And so our next question, how do we reconcile God's forgiveness of our sins with the idea of God's judgment on sin? Yeah, this is a very, very important question this week. And uh, one thing I want to begin by stating is that sin is bigger than us. And sin is bigger than, you know, someone stealing money or someone committing adultery. Um, it is bigger than that. These are sinful acts as a result of sin. Capitalized S-I-N leads, leads to sinful acts. Sin is a universal issue. There is a cosmic conflict. We've been talking a lot about that this quarter, the great controversy is real. Satan rebelled against God in heaven. The Bible says that he had to, that God had to throw him out of heaven, warn to the inhabitants of the earth, because the devil is here. And so we have a conflict between good and evil, Christ and Satan. And not only the, um, the devil himself, Lucifer, but they also fallen angels 
who are involved, who left heaven, and they also on Lucifer's side. Then we look at the character of God, which may be on trial because there is a, a devil who's saying, well, God is not merciful, that God is not just. So the whole universe is watching how this will all play out. With the prophecy reminds us that Earth is the only fallen planet, which means the other planets or areas in the universe, the persons are who are not involved in this cosmic conflict. So some persons may say, you know, sometimes we look at sin as, you know, I did something evil, I spoke at something negative about the challenger, so I'm overwhelmed by sin. And that is, that is a part of the experience, but sin is bigger than us. So God will forgive my sins every time I confess. God will forgive your sins, Sister Challenger, every time you confess it, and he can eradicate it from the book. But outside of eradicating sin from the book, sin has to be eradicated from the planet. And there must be a judgment on sin. And death has to die. Satan has to be eternally punished. Those who are going to be on the side of Satan will be eternally punished punished in hell and the bible says iniquity or sin will not rise up a second time so when god is ultimately going to eradicate sin from the planet when god is ultimately going to destroy satan there is now vindication of god's name so it is much bigger than god just forgiving you for for saying something that is evil there is a universal issue that is beyond us which god has to judge which God has to um, deal with. So in the end, sin can ultimately be eradicated from the planet. You know, you know, when I think of this question, we look at God's mercy and yet still his judgment. The story of David comes back to mind. Yeah. You know, we, we know the story inside out, but just for reenactment, you know, David saw this beautiful lady on while he was on top of his roof, when he should have been at war, right? And lost devoured him he was told she's married but that didn't stop him he invited her over we know her as Bathsheba and you know the end result she got she gets pregnant and David instead of recognizing at this point he should have recognized how far he's gone hey I messed up but no he continues the thing where he sends for her husband try to send him home but this man was such a man of honor of faith and dedication <laughs> Uriah the Hittite that he refuses yes it's that David's quarters how can I go home and enjoy my wife when all the men of Israel are in battle an honorable man not even that caught David's attention here he plots now to take this man's life mm. and so when we look at Psalms 51 God's judgment comes into play yes because the child died. Correct. All right. Yes, God is merciful. Yes, God forgives David. But that first child between David and Bathsheba, God did not allow the child to live. Yes, David prayed, he fasted. But God permitted the child to die. And we know what's the end result of the constant conflict in, in, in David's home because of his act. And so I yeah. do see sin, yeah. God's mercy, and also his judgment. Right in that story of David. And that's why he could write from such a position of God's love and mercy. Purge me with hyssop because in and of himself, he's unworthy. I don't deserve your mercy, God. But you, only you can clean me. I've sinned against you. And this is a real prayer of confession. Amen. Any thoughts on that before we yes, move on? Such a powerful, powerful illustration you gave there and a powerful point you raised in there because as we, we, we spoke about earlier, uh, the implications or consequences of sin, it is real. It is like a disease. It infects the soul. It infects the soul now and ultimately it would infect us to the extent that we may end up in hell fire. What is also dangerous about sin based on the, 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 the way you beautifully express this story is how it impacts others. It infects others around us and the number of persons are now involved in this one act where david is going to watch this woman he's going to reach out for her and get her pregnant and just all the persons who are now involved in this scenario so there are real implications and um, real consequences so we cannot play with sin our eternal destiny is really hinged 
on the decision we make to reject sin and to stand up and do what is right. Amen. But you know what I love about this story? That David was sincere. I normally contrast David's life with that of Saul. Yes, he sinned when he recognized how far he was from God. He ran to God. But look at Saul. He kept making excuses. God, I did it because justifying his sinful deeds. Yeah. And you know, that, that really says a lot about us when we rationalize sinning to the point that we justify doing it. And I'm really happy the way that David penned Psalms 51. And, you know? Amen. Yes. Yeah. So how do the expression of God's mercy in the New Testament fit with those in Psalms? And I'm going to read a few of the New Testament verses to see how well they fit in with God's mercy in the book of Psalms. So Ephesians 2 verses 4 and 5 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Then 1 Timothy 1 16 says, However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Titus 3 and verse 5, he says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And then Hebrews 4, 16, this is a powerful one. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Who, how do the expressions of God's mercy in the New Testament fit in with the Psalms? Talk to us, Dr. White. Amen, amen. So this lesson is so beautiful. And the last few weeks we've been looking at the Psalm is expressing what God did for them in history. And one of the major highlights would be God delivering them from, from, the, from Egypt and God also allowing them to go through the Red Sea. And the Red Sea experience is a cleansing experience. As we go back to the passage you read in the New Testament, we see a link between the two, uh, that when they, God put them through the sea, Paul says it so beautifully, and it was a washing, it was a cleansing. So there's a direct link here between the Red Sea experience that they recall in, in the psalm. And also in the New Testament, we see the Apostle Paul just emphasizing what God was able to accomplish. We also see God's deliverance at the sea. There are numerous passages in the Psalms that speak about deliverance. Uh, a number of times the psalmist cries, Deliver me, O oh God, from my enemy. You know, will my enemy triumph over me? Will they laugh at me? Will they say, Where is this God? And so we continue to see the cry for deliverance in the psalm, but we also see that God is able to deliver, not only deliver them from the physical bondage, but as we move to the New Testament, we see also the salvation that is available because it's a spiritual experience God really wanted them to have coming out of Egyptian bondage. So there's a physical deliverance, but it's also a, a spiritual deliverance. And you see the New Testament speaking about this washing, this revival, this change which God is able to accomplish. God's forgiveness is in the psalm. God's forgiveness is also evidence in the new testament there is a cry to god in the psalms and he and he responds and in the new testament it was, we echo the same point that we cry out unto him and he's going to respond what i love about the, the psalms and also it, um it's also reflected in the new testament is the blessing which god gives to the righteous when we walk in his ways he has blessings in store for us and he says come boldly come boldly before the sword of grace. Come before the sword of grace so that you can find mercy. And you can find mercy. And so the righteous cries, the Lord responds. He, his desire is to bless the, the righteous. And so the, the, the Psalms and the New Testament passages we read, they're just so beautiful as we see the consistency of Scripture and the God we are serving is indeed a loving God. He is a merciful God. And we can do nothing else but to respond to that mercy and say praise the Lord and hallelujah. Amen. What are your takeaways from this week's lesson? 
that one thing you want us to hold on to? You know, the mercy of God stood out in my mind this week. It made me think a lot more about it. And I think it's in Sunday's lesson, or one, one very early in the lesson, um, the writer spoke about God's mercy in creation. You know, we, we always think of creation, but sometimes we don't really think of mercy at that point. God's mercy in creation, because he created the world, but he did not turn his back on the world. Uh, the same way he created the planet, he sustains the planet. I think that was a beautiful point. Um, that's a major takeaway. God's actions in history. Um, I think that was another highlight. So the same God who acted in creation, he sustains the world. We can trace him in history as we go back to the same Red Sea and everything else that he did. But we can also look at God's um, interaction or God um, responding to us. Today, God's action in my life, and, and that reflects his mercy. So his mercy is from creation, redemption in the past. Today, his mercy is going to be forever. And we can understand when the Bible writer says he's the same yesterday, he's the same today, and he's the same forever. Because mercy is a part of his character, and he can do nothing else but be merciful. Because that's, that's who he is. That was the takeaway for me, that the mercy is consistent. Because it's in line with the character of God. Amen. You know, when when I think of mercy, I remember this song. I know it's older than I am, but I came across it while searching on YouTube by Jimmy Swaggart. He said, mercy be wrote by life. You know, and it, it says a lot. He says, I would, could have fallen my soul or cast down, but mercy Amen. rewrote my life. And so... Today, plenty of us can explain just how mercy remote our lives. And so, Dr. White, I wanted to pray specifically that we will recognize God's mercy and will appreciate it and not spurn it. Father, as we pray, Father, this morning, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace, your compassion. We recognize today our nothingness. We recognize our need of you. And we're happy to know that you will not change as the psalmist reminded us this week we can trust your mercy we can believe in you and that you're god who's ready to forgive because sin comes with guilt and sin comes with shame and sometimes like like paul we say the things that we want to do we don't do those things the things we say i will not do these are the things that we do and we cry out oh wretched man oh wretched woman that i am who shall deliver me from this body of death and today lord even when we cry the Bible gives us the assurance that your mercy is available, that no one can go so low that they cannot fight until you. Somebody is on this platform this morning saying that I've reached low in my walk with Christ. I pray today that they will cry out so that you lift them up and give them the encouragement they need to keep pressing forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Dr. White, truly want to thank you for being our presenter this morning. We really appreciate your depth of knowledge. We ask that God will continue to enlarge your territory, to enlarge your intellect as you help to, you know, guide us in God's study of his words. And in your ministry at Salt Leeward Conference, that he will give you the spirit to do great things. And we also want to thank all of you for joining with us. And we ask for your constant prayer that together we may make it into the kingdom. And to all of Whispering Hope Land, we ask you to continue to like, to subscribe, and to share so together we can make it. We invite you back at 6.30 for Ask Your Past Series with Pastor Ovid Joseph. And then at 7, we invite you to listen to our young adults as they discuss their lesson on Inverse. So until we see you again, God bless.